So good evening, everybody, and welcome to another session of Masterclass in Audio. Uh, this is session 14, isn't it? Uh, session, uh, session 12. 12. It's just session 12. Uh, so quick, uh, a few quick rules. Uh, kindly keep your mics muted. Um, uh, this is just to avoid any, you know, uh, noise coming in and disrupting and distracting us from the topic at hand. Uh, you can raise any questions that you have. Uh, kindly do so in the chat. Uh, uh, Karthik is going to be monitoring that all the time and, and at a relevant point when uh, if it's relevant to the discussion and needs to be put in he'll, he, he will interrupt uh, JR and ask that question otherwise we will definitely have a Q&A post this session where you can uh, clear any doubts that you have or ask any uh, questions that so may arise from this real deep dive that we're going to do in, in uh, analog audio. So let me introduce our guests for this, uh, or our master for this evening, uh, J.R. Uh, Boakler, or Boakler, nice. <laughs> is much pronunciations. Well, J.R. did his BA in philosophy and has a wide range of experiences before entering the realm of audio. He has held executive positions in several top institutions and is very widely traveled. He has consulted extensively in the past for a variety of verticals, uh, including financial services, strategy, logistics, and in addition to volunteering on many fronts. And then JR joined uh, Wally Malik, Malik am I right? Malik uh, the founder of Wally's Tools. Uh, JR will definitely uh, talk a lot more about this. Um, and he worked with Wally as his production assistant ever since the late 90s. Uh, after Wally's passing, JR and Wally's sons, Andrex, have been leading and managing Wally's tools and WAM Engineering. Uh, WAM Engineering LLC is the worldwide leader in turntable setup tools. Okay, they're, they're, they're very specific uh, and very focused on what they do. Uh, and these turntable setup tools and they uh, and their, their entire, um, this thing is to exist to help the audiophile achieve the highest degree of performance and extract every drop of performance out of their turntables. So uh, we are planning to do multiple sessions with JR. JR very kindly has said that uh, his, his subject is so vast, he won't be able to cover it in one session. And we're going to do uh, many more sessions. So this first session will provide an overview of analog audio and how it compares with digital and why, according to JR, analog reign supreme. So that's a very vast topic. I mean, if we even take a tiny uh, aspect of it, we'll be, we'll be going down several rabbit holes, not just one. And uh, JR is very fond of doing that. And we are also very happy to hear from you and learn from you, JR. And uh, you. let's just take it away and, and you know, lead us on that path of analog. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. So yeah, first, yeah topic of the question obviously that comes in mind is you know i mean um analog has been around uh, since um the inception of sound we human beings are analog right i mean that's the way we perceive sound so uh with the advent of digital and uh, the advent of the mp3 i say which is the death knell for, for good audio uh, but uh, increasingly digital has upped the ante and has come and and a lot of people say digital sounds as good as analog well you're going to differentiate that for us and tell us whether that's true or not and what does one need to do to get make sure that your entire analog chain is pristine and that will take you for another a tick give you another meaning, another experience yeah. of listening to your audio collection. Yeah, yeah. The, exceedingly few people um, have ever heard how good uh, analog transcription is. Um, mm -hmm. Even those who've lived with their turntable for, uh, for decades haven't optimized it. In fact, I, you know, one of the things we do here in the laboratory is we analyze cartridges for their optimal alignment um, within the group. There are four angles to be concerned with. And regularly when we, our clients get the cartridges back into their hands with the means to hit all of those four angles, almost invariably the, the response back is, wow, I'd never heard this from my records before. And it's quieter. There's more information. It's more immersive. Well, you know, analog, uh, Analog, it is a mechanical transcription medium, right? So the 
the groove was created in the first place in the cutting lab by a particular shaped tool, a cutting stylus. And we know what the shape of that stylus is and, and how sharp it is on the sides and try not to get too technical, but I wanna give a high altitude view. And, and so just like you can imagine a square peg doesn't fit into a round hole very well. Um, That's true. And, and unless you decrease the size of the square peg so it'll fit through the, <laughs> through the hole. The, the similar uh, similar uh, concept applies to vinyl playback. If you don't use a stylus that is a facsimile of the shape that was used to create the groove and then orient it so that it is re re reading the groove in the same four angles that it was laid down in, well, you won't get all of the information. You won't hear how quiet it is. You won't hear... Um, the layering between instrumentation and the distance in 3D space between all the instrumentation. Um, analog analog is, is poorly understood in large part because of the conversation that we have had about analog, even before the advent of digital, was just, just good enough to be able to get you to play it at home, right? That's the conversation we had in the right. audio magazines. And, right. and even much of the scientific work that had been um, done in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s by uh, researchers on, on how to understand the interface between the stylus and the groove had been, um, a lot of it was actually ignored because of, uh, largely because of, um, uh, I suppose, because going down some of those um, taking the advice of some of the researchers would have made things more, let's say, uh, uh, commercially unviable, right? Um, well, a case in point, um, researchers have been trying to tell uh, uh, playback uh, cartridge manufacturers to get the cantilever angle down at least since 1962. Okay, and that's documented yeah. up there. Yeah, and and because it sounds better when you can get down to about 18 degrees or at least 20, right? Okay. Um, but most, the average uh, cartridge is up at 27, 28, 29, 30, 32, oh, right? Okay. Oh, wow. But the benefit of, of getting up there, why why do the cartridge manufacturers get kick up their cantilever angle? Because it makes the cartridge more forgiving to you not keeping your tone arm under control. Oh. So. Uh, but that's something that you know, we make a tool for that. So you don't have to worry about that, right? right. Um, so anyway, but before I, I could go down into, um, it, 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 you, 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 as I mentioned to you before, you have to stop me from going down rabbit holes. No, no, I, go ahead. This is interesting detail, stuff. Right? <laughs> I, want, I want to speak, to, uh, you know, I certainly want to spend time speaking to the people who have never heard analog, right? I want to time, uh, spend some time talking to people who have heard that you know digital is so much better than analog, right? Um, and 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 share some some facts which which may be new to some people. But um, how to achieve all of these parameters? And there are seven alignment parameters, by the way: mm -hmm. one linear dimension, two forces, and four angles. You know, I've got videos on all of this on my website, right? Yeah, um, um, rather than concentrating and talking about those, we'll, we'll speak, if you don't mind, I mean, if there's questions, we can go at it, but speak at a, at a higher level. And what, is vi what does analog have to offer? So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm very blessed. I get to play at the high end, right? Yep. And my clients are tend to tend to be at the high end, right? And I've heard systems costing uh, you know well over a million and a half dollars you mm. know two million dollars i've heard some fantastic si systems and i can certainly say that the amount of money you pay for a system does not guarantee you better sound <laughs> that, that, that's true in any part of the world <laughs> yeah. yes definitely definitely okay most expensive system i heard bored me to tears <laughs> oh, really? okay. um so um, you know, you can you can get sound without spending you know, a full absolute fortune um, with analog. And, and I have and I, I geez, I, I love it when 
when I spend some time with a client and um, and we optimize their analog and and then compare it to digital, many of my clients uh, before I'm done helping them uh, optimize their analog have spent much more on their digital than on their analog, right? And spent more time listening to their digital than their analog. But I can't tell you the amount of times that when we're done working together, they say, well, if I sell my DAC now, because I'm not listening to it anymore, I can buy so many more. Release some money to buy an even better tone arm or an even better, better <laughs> cartridge, right? Um, look, there's digital is fantastic and it's getting better. It is, right? That analog is getting better too. And there's a number of a, a ways in which it is getting better. I was actually on a on an expert panel at the Munich show, which is the largest hi-fi show in, in the world, <clears throat> with um uh, Leif Johansson of Ortofon, Mark Doman of Doman Audio, and uh, Craig Milnes of Wilson Benesh. Okay. Michael Framer was moderating, and the whole topic of the of the panel was: Has vinyl playback technology gone as far as it can go? And uh, I, the answer is a resounding no. And I lay out that there are two main reasons for it. One. Uh, analytical powers that we have today, the technology that we have today, the computational power that we have today is so far and above what it was even 20 years ago. And it's more expensive, I mean, less expensive too. I mean, like laser interferometry, which it is oh, yeah. a new area I really want to look at. Laser interferometry is a, is a technology whereby you can scan a surface of a body um, scan a surface of a, 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 a material a body that's at play in some way and see how is it vibrating in both in frequency and in amplitude. Okay. Sure. Um, and this is, so th this is, this is exciting because in our world of analog, and here's a, a fact that most, many people probably had no idea in our world of analog, and I can show a photo. The, the, the groove is a 45 and 45 degree groove that's cut. 45 degree, 45 degree, right? And it's a channel. And then as, as the walls push up, Move up and down. Yeah. back and forward, they create that those perturbations create an excitement of a coil, which is six millimeters away in that's sitting in a magnetic flux field. All right. And then of course, when you excite a coil that's sitting in a magnetic flux field, it throws off an electrical signal. Well, in, there have been many questions in the past that asking the question, what is the smallest perturbation we can make in the groove wall and still have it be audible under normal commercially available amplification systems? And th the studies don't all agree with each other, but, but the most conservative study says 350 uh, uh, in the low triple digit nanometer range. Nanometer? Whoa. Nanometer. Yeah. Be micrometers and nanometer. No, micrometer. No, micrometers. I'll show you a photograph if you like. Um, micrometers are loud. <laughs> okay, loud. I mean, even single digit. And I'll show you. Um, those can be loud, right? The, the 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 you know the wavelength of violet light is about 450 nanometers. So we're talking perturbations in the groove that are smaller than the most powerful optical microscope could possibly resolve, right? Way smaller than that, that we can hear. But in order to extract, and, and now all, it's all of that low level, of course it's low level information, right? Right, when you get down that infinitesimally small. But the that's where all of the reality lies. The small bit of the cues that suggest the echo off the back wall the cues that suggest how much resin is on that bow, you know, the cues okay. that suggest the, the difference between a Guarneri and a Stradivarius, you know, oh, no. um, you know, these are, these, these are, you know, the harmonics that so, are. So you're basically saying that uh, analog, the groove can uh, give you greater definition than a CD can, because a CD uses an ultraviolet laser at 450 nanometers, like you mentioned, and the, and the groove can resolve it down to 350 nanometers. So I've, I, you know, I've heard digital front end systems costing over a quarter million dollars against 
analog system costing a fraction of that and the analog is Wins and more numbers. realistic you know and 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 you know it shouldn't be that way really i mean tech on technical basis alone i'm i mean you know one of the most apparent things to people when they hear a really well-tuned analog system against a great digital and you can spend more on the digital that's fine once you reach a certain threshold on analog it's just excellent period and what what people notice is that this the quality of the sound stage it it's as it, it's so realistic you could feel like you could walk into it in amongst the performers right whereas uh say on that same stereo system a really really high end digital system will do a beautiful job but it doesn't have that same sense of realism that walk through sound stage it's like the difference of between looking at a landscape where you can the three dimensionality of what you're looking at is obvious enough that you feel you could walk around into it versus looking at a movie screen where you can mm -hmm. see the verisimilitude of depth, but you aren't fooled to think you could walk into the screen, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and you know, the cues off of the, the back wall of the recording studio and just the low level information, all of that is, is there. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to be dismissive. I don't want to be dismissive of digital. It's getting better and better. It was truly miserable for decades. I, I, I couldn't stand the sound of it. Right. right. And, and there are some people, um, some people like me that, you know, <laughs> that heard that and many other people were just dazzled by how quiet it was. Right. Well, analog, you don't have to suffer ticks and pops with analog. You know, of course that's the, that's the common complaint. Right? This was my next question coming to you. you say it it's so quiet. I, I mean, records are traditionally, you know, equated with the yes. rattle and hum and the buzz, you know, and the yeah, pop. No, like, no, no, not if you've cared for if you, not if you've cared for your setup I and mean, you've cared for your 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 records. Now, are some records pressed sloppily and haphazardly so that they are noisy from the plant yeah but those are few and far between oh. at, at least for the records that that um, i buy and my clients and my uh, my my friends buy um every once in a while there'll be one that i get um like, like this soundtrack from um uh, uh blade runner 2049 Right. I love that on digital because it's got subsonic information, which I when when we got a system tuned really well, I want people to be able to experience what is subsonic information sound like? What is it more appropriately what what feel? It feel like? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, if they've got a system capable um, of, of doing that. Yeah. Um, but on on vinyl, at least the copy I have, it's noisy as hell. I, I can't listen to it. It's unlistenable. Okay. Yeah. And I put it through, you know, the the uh ultrasonic uh cleaning you know, no yeah it, it's printed into the ground. It's just sloppy work and you know in any industry you're going to find do people doing sloppy work right so uh yeah the the world the the world that we have to play with, it's just absolutely infinitesimal can i show you a photograph please please do okay all right let's see here uh, this this is an interesting one okay are you seeing the image? Yep. Yes, we are. Okay. So what we're looking at here is I've taken my laboratory microscope and I've tilted it at 45 degrees. And now remember the groove walls are 45 and 45. And this is 6,300 times magnification. So I only wanted to resolve one groove wall. So okay. are you able to see my cursor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So over on the left side here is the bottom of the groove. Okay. And here is the land of the record of the top surface. Okay. okay. Now you see these undulations horizontally yeah. oriented yeah. in the image here. Yeah. This is taken from an Ordifon test record on the test sweep. The test sweep is the is the uh, track that goes right, up, up in frequency. And this is the high frequency portion. I wanted to look at the high frequency portion and, and just see what it looked like. So each one of these ridge lines is the physical manifestation of a sine wave. Yeah. Remember, well, this is the analog world, right? We take, right. we we experience 
we experience pressure waves and they are mm -hmm. represented graphically as sine waves and they are here represented materially as waves on, on a, in a vinyl surface right Right. Now you see you see the distance between the the peaks of the waveform because from one peak here to one peak there is mm -hmm. one full sine wave. One wave yeah. Eleven microns. Okay, eleven microns, and this is why it's advantageous to to use a fine line contact stylus, and I can show one of those two later. Um, a fine line contact stylus versus a conical stylus, so that you can read all of this information. 11 microns, that's nothing. Now, a human hair could fill up this whole screen, okay? A human hair will fill up this whole screen, right? Now, the, if, we could, if we could measure the height of each one of these bumps, it would be about three microns. And this is a loud signal. This is a loud signal. I'm sorry, it wasn't 6,300, it was 3,700. I doubled it somehow. 3,700 times magnification. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is this is the size of the prize. This is, this, the, and again, this is loud information. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I find that, that image fascinating. And I like to share that one. Um, I should spend more time looking at looking at more of the detail because there's a lot of interesting things in these groups.